networking works. Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a small architectural practice that lets you do your best work more often. It's my pleasure to bring to you today a conversation with architect Mark Elster. Mark Elster is a principal of one of the leading residential architecture firms in the Pacific Northwest, AOME Architects. He currently acts as the managing partner, principal of the practice, and today you'll get to hear insights about how Mark, with his partners, grew the practice into one of the leading high-end residential firms in the area, as well as his discoveries in leadership, leading teams, networking, business development, and so much more. Mark also happens to be one of the courageous and heroic firm owners that work with us here at Business of Architecture, uh, implementing the smart practice method into their practice. So without further ado, here's my interview with architect Mark Elster. Hello, Mark, and welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you, Enoch. It is super good to have you here. And I would just like you to start out just telling our audience how you came into being the uh, leader in a practice. How did you move your way into firm ownership? What was that like for you? Well, I began in this firm as an employee because I didn't have a license. But during that period, I was the only employee in our entire history that brought work into the office in 35 years. <laughs> and uh, I helped found the office in a moonlighting capacity where the four of us originally met. And so I was effectively a founder, but I couldn't be licensed because of IRS rules and so forth. And so a few years later, when I became licensed, it it became apparent to everybody, including myself, how, men, how much the operation depended on a number of the things I was doing for the office already. And after it became a principal, my my big concern was carrying my share of the weight and bringing in work. And I started applying myself to just how do you do that? Because going into it, we had just gotten lucky. We had connections that just dumped work in our lap, essentially. And that dried up and we had to figure out how to secure work that wasn't just automatically coming in the door. And I, I was the only partner to crack that code and had an aptitude for it and started to make it rain for the whole firm. And so over time, it just, it just happened that I was leading more of the initiatives in the firm and kind of guiding the firm forward. And it's not until uh, five to seven years ago that I, I began to realize I was actually managing the firm. I was the managing principal, but only in name only. I, I didn't have an official title or a compensation to reflect that. Yeah. Uh, just prior to that time period, or actually I, it's further back than that. Um, two of my original partners retired, leaving uh, my current partner, myself on our own. And it was during that transition that I began to recognize there was a built in imbalance because I was managing most of the aspects of the firm. Uh, of the business aside from the projects themselves and that uh, there there weren't good ways available to either of us to divide that workload up. Uh, he just didn't have the capacity to do those other things or the interest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so now we're into a transition period of me functioning as the literal managing partner and preparing for him to retire in his turn. He's eight years older than I am. Beautiful. So we're in the process of executing that transition together. Beautiful. That sums it up. Well, Mark, tell me, what, what do you, tell me about your, you know, you said you cracked the code of business development. For you, what, what, what does that mean? Well, part of it was learning how to verbally convey in a, a, a short time frame. So usually this is, it's a networking enterprise. And in networking situations, you have anywhere from five minutes to two and a half hours, depending on the situation and the person, to get your message across. So you have to, you have to formulate pithy ways for the five-minute conversation and more elaborate ways uh, and, and uh, 
more full, fully complete ways of conveying a compelling reason for working with AOME, uh, how we differentiate ourselves from the competition. And in particular, I've found this message resonates with two groups that are key channels that direct work to us, general contractors and realtors. And we have different things to offer and, and highlight to those two groups because they've got different interests. And part of my secret sauce, my superpower is being able to tailor my message to those audiences. And it this I think that's one of the other things that I, I learned early is architects, I, I tell students who ask me what architects do, I tell them they talk for a living. Mm, tell me about that. Now, most architects focus on talking with drawings and maybe specifications. So they don't think of it as a very verbal, oral type of exercise. But my partner and I long ago realized that design is the easy part of what we do. It's all the communications, all the oral communications and verbal communications and writing that happen that supplement and surround that design activity that are actually oftentimes more critical to collaborating with your peers and persuading people, selling and so forth. And while I was thinking about that problem and becoming more overtly aware of it, it dawned on me that in each case, part of what you're doing, if you're doing it well, is understanding who your audience is and tailoring, shifting, modifying your communications to suit that audience. And that that is not easy for everybody to do on the fly. I think people can learn to do it better. I certainly did over, over time. But a big part of it is becoming self-consciously aware of what your audience is needing to hear, wanting to hear, uh, or as we've discussed in some of the business of architecture programs, uh, give, give me a new framework or a language for it. How does this situation occur to them versus how it's occurring to you? And apparently years ago, I instinctively arrived at some version of that that I, I didn't have in that word form, but that's essentially what it was. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as soon as you can click on that switch in your brain to be able to recognize that and and then very quickly be able to shift gears the moment you hear something else occurring differently to the your audience then then you can interact with them more productively and more engagingly and so forth and so i've i've gotten really good at that and uh, along the way we've crafted our message that we have to deliver those different audiences so it's it's pretty powerful to them and powerful in the sense that uh, like I, I had a contractor comment to me last week when I took him out to dinner that the, at the previous meeting where I had requested the, the dinner opportunity to meet, he said he was very surprised and very pleased that I approached him in the way I did. Uh, he was disappointed at this event that he had hosted that no other architects did the same thing. Mm, and mm. right there, I stood out because I, I connected with him. Mm. And a lot of times contractors think that architects have them at arm's length or that they're a second class citizen or mm, you know some mm -hmm. other version of that. Mm -hmm. So the very fact that I approached him and said, hey, I, what you said at this event really resonated with me. And I think we need to meet because mm. we should be able to work together well. Mm, and mm. I wasn't flattering him. I really was impressed with what he said. And from that, I had an instinct, which has turned out to be correct, that we should meet and find out more about each other and see about how we can work together. And so that that ability to connect with people, I think, is the key to starting off the all the other next steps that have to happen to selling, uh, selling your services. Mark, and would you, getting would you, other people to, to sell them for you. So this contractor is going to sing my praises because he heard things from me he hasn't heard from any other architect. Mm. That just kind of blew his mind. Like, oh, I've never thought of it that way. You're right, type of reactions. Mm. 
Now, would you say that this is something that just came naturally to you, Mark, because you're a social person, you kind of intuitively get people, or is this a skill that you've had <laughs> oh, no. to uh, work at? <laughs> I had to work at it. I yeah. definitely had to work at it. Uh, I was fundamentally a, a pretty introverted, uh, not shy necessarily, but I, I preferred to, I, I'm a loner very often when I work. Uh, and it was it was not in my nature to glad hand and, and say hi to everybody. Uh, small talk was not really appealing to me. I didn't appreciate the value of it. And what changed for me was getting married to a uh, social butterfly, my wife, Nancy Ellen, who uh, she's, she credits me with teaching her how to be more assertive and, and declare her feelings about things and, and confront them head on instead of, you know, sweeping them under the rug. It's been very effective for her. Uh, she gave to me an awareness of the value of making connections with people you don't know and not feeling, you know, like at, at people, you see people at cocktail parties that are just standing around. They can't start a conversation with anybody. I was that person. And I, I still struggle with that a little bit in that particular situation. It's, it's a little hard to get started in some cases. But from her... I observed not only how to do it, but how to do it well and how to enjoy it and and then see the collateral or the, the resulting benefits of it, not just to her, but to the other person. And you might detect I'm an observer of events around me. That's that's always been a property of my my personality. And when I compared my shy, reserved uh, disconnectedness in those type of situations compared to hers, you know, talking to the grocer and saying hi to the neighbor on the street and that sort of thing, I, I saw the, the deficit in my life and the benefit and positives in her life from those two different approaches. And I started to model it. And I didn't think of it as a business thing at first, but then it, it didn't take too long for me to say, well, huh, duh, <laughs> this this would be of great benefit in in my work because I do I talk to people for a living. So I credit my wife for opening my eyes to that. Mm, wonderful. Mark, what would you say to uh, people who don't have a Mary Ellen in their life, so to speak, how uh, have you experienced anything else that would help someone uh, who may be more introverted on the introverted side be able to to crack that nut? Well, yeah. Th so I married Nancy Ellen, so I, I, you know, I just had it given to me. But essentially, she was my mentor in this particular aspect, and. Anybody can it can seek out someone who has a talent and ability that you admire and recruit them as a mentor. Most people that have a high level skill like that are happy to share it and and to mentor and coach a little bit. Everybody has limits. I mean, it depends on how much access you have to the person. But you can even you can use someone as a mentor that you have no contact with at all, other than remotely through nowadays podcasts and YouTube videos and certainly books are a probably a much deeper way to get into it. But yeah, you can, you can dis determine that you want to pick up a new skill. Now, granted, you do have to have some underlying aptitudes. Uh, you know, at BOA, you and now our firm, we advocate taking the personality test to kind of expose to yourself and your your peers, colleagues, where you sit on that that uh, that four pie chart <laughs> for the disc profile at least. And certain sectors of that profile, if you really pegged in one end, you're you're just never going to be a salesperson, right? So you do have to recognize your own limitations and your own. Uh, strengths and and so forth and play to those and be honest with yourself but but once you've got a clear understanding of that and and recognize you have a deficit in terms of skill and learning and practice and all that 
finding a mentor that you can work with side by side uh, or adopting one remotely at an arm's length or across the world is a, a great way to pick up how to how to do something like that currently you, you aome does does a lot of very very high-end residences one of the the leading firms in in the pacific northwest now when you were it's one thing to to network it's another thing to network effectively mark what what have you found to be the the effective way to actually network the most effective way is one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Uh, the the entry-level way is to go to networking events. And we're mm -hmm. fortunate in the Northwest, we have a couple of forward-thinking, marketing-oriented people in the publishing industry that recognize the synergy of creating network events for people in the industry to get together and network, socialize, shoot the ball, learn about each other's business and so forth. And every once in a while a connection is made and, and you find a new work partner to, to associate with. And in the meantime, those people are grateful for that publisher providing that opportunity and it creates a motivation, additional motivation for them to continue advertising and spending money uh, promoting themselves through that magazine and, and promoting it to others as well. So in those situations, you're in a large crowd. It's noisy. It's, it's like a big cocktail party in many cases, and it's hard to make great connections. So I use those as an opportunity to say, hi, you know, I'm Mark Elster, AOME Architects. Uh, from what I've read about, so I do homework in advance too. So I find out who's going to be there and I check out, nowadays you can check out their website in most cases and you get a preview of what their business is like, if there's uh, commonalities or overlap of the, the demographic group that you're serving. And you can, in advance, kind of discount who you're not going to spend time trying to meet and who you want to focus on meeting. And since you can't get in a deep conversation, the, the, the main extent of the conversation is, here's my card or, or you know, you air, airdrop something to share with your phones of how to connect later. I want to connect later. And then you have to follow up and connect. And that's the most important part. And then once you do connect that one-on-one, -on -one, I like to have lunch, dinner, or drinks with, with the folks I want to uh, network with. And I, I tell them I'm going to allow one to two and a half hours. That signals right away to that other party that this is important to me. I, I'm a busy guy and I'm going to take that much time out of my day for you, to meet you, to understand you. And then when I get there, I'm really interested in them. And they're expecting most times that it's effectively like a, a job interview. Mm -hmm. that, that I'm going to find out information about them to evaluate whether they're a good working partner. Because mm -hmm. architects, we, we have the advantage or disadvantage, depending on your perspective, of being at the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. we, we lead the whole orchestra through the mm -hmm. especially in residential mm -hmm. architecture. And so people lower on that pyramid hierarchy feel as, as if they're in a secondary or tertiary position relative to the architect. So when an architect devotes an hour to two hours to them, you signal to them, no, you're more important to me than that. Mm, mm. And so that that seeds the conversation already in a, in a positive light or, or frames it in a positive light that they appreciate. It's, it's flattering and it's a genuine signal of my interest in getting to know them. What sometimes surprises them is that I spend 50% or more of the time we have together making an interview of them against me or about me and the firm. So I look at it as a selling process coupled with an evaluation process. So I'm evaluated. Do I really want to work with this person and their company? And I kind of get that out of the way early, or I've done research ahead of time to know that I think that's where it's going to head to make it worthwhile spending this time. And then once, once I have the, that established and, and my instincts in the conversation are reinforcing that, then I get into switching the tables around 
so that the remainder becomes an interview of me selling AOME architects and how we approach the work and our process and the benefits they're going to reap from working with us versus what they've experienced with other architects, architect firms and, and the usual way they're accustomed to them working together. And for contractors and realtors, they eat it up. And uh, the, the power of that is pretty simple. Most architects don't bother to do that with people like this. Or if they do bother, they don't do it as well. They don't give as much time. They, they, they spend too much time emphasizing the hierarchy and conveying that you are beneath me. And if you're lucky, I'll refer work to you type of approach to things. And that they, they have no, no compunction on their part to sell why you should want to work with the architect. So networking works. If you do your research, you know what you want to achieve. You know what the other side can offer to the extent you can extract from a website visit and other sources. Uh, oh, I, I left out. I also, part of the networking is having people re recommend that I connect with other people. Mm, mm. And then you have an opportunity for a smaller conversation of a trusted colleague, mutual colleague, to share their impressions of that other party and you have an even stronger sense of whether you could work together. Like oftentimes I get a type of referral that, Mark, you have to call this person because you and they have to work together. Just, you, I can tell you just guys, you're going to get along. It's going to work mm, great. That's amazing. I love it. What a great, we have a little mini masterclass here in networking. Thank you for that, Mark. That was great. Huh. That's great. I'm curious uh, when you when you came and started working with us here at Business of Architecture, uh, you were already established businessman, uh, had a very 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 successful yep. practice, and uh, you were by no means a newbie to the game of business, right? right? And yet you still managed to learn some things. What what would you say would be the the most impactful things that you've learned out of your time uh, here at Business of Architecture? Huh. I think the most important is learning with great clarity how much the problems I have had in the business are because of me, mm. not because of the people I've hired. Mm. Now, mm. Admittedly, the people I've hired have caused problems also, but the, mm -hmm. the continuing problems are mostly a symptom of being a generalist architect in in the old renaissance form uh, i i was fortunate in my formative years to be exposed to a number of trades through my father grandfather my other grandfather and other family members and friends and through that i developed ability to do a lot of different things. And I grew up with this underlying frugality that if I can do it well or better than the next guy, why should I pay someone to do when I can do it myself? And my wife uh, will tell this story about how uh, I didn't want to buy a dining room table for our new house because I could build it myself. Mm. And I, I'm right, I could have built it myself. Mm -hmm. but I would first have to pry open time in my busy schedule because a dining room table in my spare time would take three months, maybe four months to build in my garage. And, mm. and it would be staying up until midnight some nights to put on finish and that sort of thing. So mm. it'd be a big disruption in my life. Mm -hmm. And because of that, guess what? I never built the dining room table. Mm. <laughs> and she'd known, she'd seen from other projects that that, that was going to be the script this time around. And she said, Honey, I know you can build the dining room table and I know it'll be gorgeous. In fact, you built one for your brother and sister-in-law and it's gorgeous. So I'd already built a dining room table and, and <laughs> so I know I could do it. And she knew I could do it. But she said, honey, you're not going to do it. You don't have mm -hmm. time and you're not going to be able to make time. Mm -hmm. Face the music. 
Mm. You're not going to make our dining room table. We need to buy one. And I think the most important thing that BOA taught me is I have to let go and pay people to do the things that I'm doing so I don't have to do them. Yeah. It's very, it's very, it's very hard to do. Easier said than done. And yeah. um, it's sort of the, the, I, the way that I would say is kind of the curse of being good at a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. It is kind of a curse. Uh, it's yeah. very much a curse. Um, I experienced that in my personal life too. Well, I give the example of the dining room table. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it, it's hard to let go of. And in some cases, it's because you're really good at doing something and there aren't many people that can do it better than you. Mm -hmm. But in, in this business, you can still look at some aspect of your talents or your capabilities like that and say, but that's a low value thing for me to be doing mm -hmm. compared to other things that I could be doing. So even mm -hmm. though I can do it well, I should hire somebody else who could do it at least as well. And maybe be pleasantly dis uh, surprised that it turns out they can actually do it better than me. In order to offload that low val lower value thing, I, like I'll give you an example. I'm I've become very good over the years at retouching photos. Mm -hmm. you know, I can take people out of photos, put new people in, and no mm. one would know. Mm. Yeah. I've developed some pretty strong Photoshop uh, post production skills, mm. but. I'm now paying someone else uh, $30 an hour to do that for me. Mm -hmm. And they actually probably aren't as good at Photoshop work as I am, but they get it done 20 times faster than I can in my spare time to wrinkle through my business months and weeks. And... I don't have to waste my brain power on it and have it distracting me from higher value things. We, we went through an exercise recently that isn't an honest reflection of the actual value, but it, it does put things in perspective. Our largest project that's in the office right now took me, uh, and I, I roughly calculated, so this is just in the ballpark. It took me 33 hours from when I recognized who I wanted to reach out to, network with them, propose that it was about time they refer to work to a project to my office. And a week later, they referred this largest project in our office to us. And like I said, 33 hours later, I had a secured signed agreement in my hands. Based on the profit that we're going to make and are making off of that my time was that was 33 hours pencil out to twenty six thousand dollars an hour yeah wow wow yeah yeah. yes now in reality it gets spread out differently than that but it, it puts in perspective the value of those hours mm -hmm. 33 hours for me to secure that project compared to 30 dollars an hour i'm paying someone for photoshop work i shouldn't be doing photoshop work <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's 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 easy to see that when we can see it put so clearly, and yet yeah. I know I fall into this uh, uh, trap. Uh, it's we we just we just do. It's it's um, it's very it's very common, and um, it holds a lot of small practice owners back because I remember seeing it as well when I used to work at other practices. The firm owners doing a lot of things and 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 just being unwilling at a certain level to let go of certain things for whatever reason, uh, lack of belief that someone else could do it, lack of trust, don't want them to mess it up. Uh, it, it truly is a, a small firm owner dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. And we're still small firms. So I still have that problem eating away at me at the, the edges because it, you have to have someone to delegate to, and you can't outsource all of it. Some of it has to be in-house and, and full-time salaried people. And it, it you have to clear these notches of, of when you can get past a, a certain threshold that it makes sense to hire that next person that then unloads the next tranche of, of things that you shouldn't be doing. And right now I'm in that uncomfortable place, that, like I mentioned to you before the interview, that I need to hire two more people and I, I, I'm not quite over that those two notches to bring them on. Mm -hmm. And so 
at the moment. I'm saddled with things that I do well that no one else can do because no one else in the office is available right now. So I got to do them. And they're not $26,000 an hour items either. Right, right. (laughs) I, you know, and I shared this with you on that webinar we did earlier this week. That was one of the most powerful things for me over a decade ago. It was probably 15 years ago when I first did that exercise of one of my mentors took me through kind of how much money I wanted to earn. And then we broke that down by the productive hours, meaning that I wouldn't be always yeah. producing income. And then we, we took a look at that, how much my time was worth per hour. And when I saw that figure that it was so large, uh, then it, it really made it a lot easier for me to, a little mental switch went off and it made it easier for me to yeah. let go a lot of the low value tasks because I could see that I was actually losing money each time I did something of lower value. I, I, in my right. mind, I was saving money. But when I looked at it that way, I realized actually I was losing that gap. So yeah. like, I know your example is so beautiful because look, an hour on Photoshop, that's $30. Uh, an hour networking, finding a fit, business development, all that, $26,000, right? Obviously it's, It's a hypothetical example like you pointed out, but it does something to the mind where we realize there's some truth to it. Like, okay, wow. So that's a $26,000 minus $30. What's that? (laughs) $25,970 gap there, you know? That's That's how much I'm losing by doing. Every time I touch that Photoshop, I'm losing (laughs) 20, 20, (laughs) dollars you know? So it's like, ah, puts in a huge perspective. Yeah, and it when when you have this insight drilled into you and it becomes real, spending your time on those other things actually becomes painful. Mm, indeed, almost uh, because you realize oh, if I if I could only solve this problem, I I would be so much further ahead of where we are. Uh, so, but the the benefit of that is it gives you a, a fire under your seat, a kick in the pants to an incentive to move forward and and work through the, the tough time that you have to put, a, like Ryan has this graph that he draws, uh, or you did actually, I think originally it was where I saw it, where this, there's this period of an upturn and then this this valley before you you get past the hardship and then then there's a nice climb. I'm in I'm in that valley <laughs> at mm. the moment. Uh, I'm having a good time at it though. I, I don't I don't want this to appear that I'm complaining about where I'm at. Yeah. I'm I'm enjoying the fact that I'm actually making forward progress and that I'm I'm seeing results. Yeah, that's beautiful. It's uh, There's a book called by Seth Godin called The Dip. And uh, to let our listeners kind of further example, I've, I've taken up jujitsu recently, uh, as I've shared before. And uh, yeah. it's and I remember when I first went to jujitsu, it was definitely a high because I'm like, it's something new. It's fun. It's it's all new for me. It's just so there's that excitement of something new. And then after going several weeks, I started to realize how terrible I was and how much better all these other people were than me. And so then I hit that dip. I'm like, oh, this is, oh, it's going to take me forever to get even a, a just a fundamental level of competence at this. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so it's that dip. But now I can feel like I'm already starting, as I'm starting to gain some skills, and I'm starting to learn a little bit. I can feel myself start to pull up out of that dip. Great. Yeah, that that does remind me of this process. It, it, if you're really flourishing in your life, I think that should happen on parallel paths through many things you're you're doing mm, mm-hmm, for yourself. Mm-hmm, indeed, uh, people that don't go through that, don't accept those challenges and and charge into them. I think are on a slow, depressing path to just kind of fading out in life. Yeah, I mean, who was it, Ralph? I guess it was Henry David Thoreau said, "The vast majority of men live lives of quiet desperation." You know, I think that's, it's easy to fall into that rut. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's sad to think about how many people avoid perceived difficulties because those hardships will be oh so devastating. Mm-hmm. And they, so they don't try. Yeah. If you don't try, you're not going to accomplish anything. Right. Exactly. And, I love, we can see the fruits of that over time just from what you've done. Mark hasn't been easy. It's been challenging. 
You know, oh, you've, yeah. you've fought to get to where you're at. And from the outside, people look at your firm and they think, wow, that's incredible what you've built, the caliber of work you're doing, the level of success you have. Uh, you're living the architect's dream. And I know it's easy from the outside to look at that and just say, oh, that uh, that must come naturally to Mark. Or, oh, he fell into that. Or, you know, it was, it was easy. It was, you know, yeah. just... Au yeah, contraire. <laughs> yeah, oftentimes they don't see what happens behind the scenes. Uh-huh. Yep. That's right. Yeah, I introduced this idea during one of the classes that Ryan really uh, took off on. Uh, Marshall's generalized iceberg theorem, that seven-eighths of everything can't be seen. Mm. And in some cases, that you, you take a negative outlook on that. That you know, it's really frustrating. You, for architects and builders, you look at a project mm. and you think you perceive the totality of it if you're delusional. Mm. Mm -hmm. And it's only later you find out that what you perceived as a totality of the project is merely the tip of the iceberg. Mm. And so that's that's the concept of this theorem: that seven eighths of the problem is usually hidden from view, and it's not until you get into the problem for a while that you discover that missing part. And Ryan's insight was, uh, and, and I kind of prompted this too. For architects, it's even worse because when you first come into a project, you perceive a tip of something that you think is the totality of the project. But then as you get into the project, the mm. client and you learn together that it's larger. So it turns out that the tip of the seven eighths that you're seeing is the tip of the real iceberg. So you say seven eighths is seven eighths of everything. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, there you go. So that's kind of a negative way of looking at it. The, the positive way is there are many things in life that I don't think we can accomplish if we were able to perceive in advance the totality of what had to be done because you would focus too much on the burden, the overburden. So having children is an example. Yeah. Yeah, it's or a good thing we people, don't know what it takes, huh? Yeah. And for some people, it's even something as trivial from my perspective now after being married for 40 years mm. of, of taking on marriage, that commitment to somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Seven eighths of the problem can't be seen when you're you're getting married, or uh, the better one is choosing to have a kid. And fortunately, you can't see it, or you mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because it is a lot of hard work, and if you focus on the the totality, it's just overwhelming and frightening. Yeah. And so I think it's a good thing that it's human nature to to actually tell little lies to ourselves about projects we're heading into and endeavors we're going to encounter. Yeah, this won't so be that So that you hard. don't give up before you even start. Yeah. Mark, what do you think about this statement? You as an architect, you deserve to be paid and not just paid, but paid well. Well, that's a very true statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and it's one that my partner and I when we first formed the firm, we actually had a, a split about that. Mm. And two of my partners were inclined to think that we were overcharging, that we weren't worth as much as what we were charging. Mm. And they were mm. almost embarrassed to make money doing mm. what we were doing. And in part, that was because we enjoyed architecture and it's fun and we do it for free type of, you know, because we do it for free for ourselves. So we obviously like architecture, doing performing architecture. But the other part was a fundamental fear that the client, that, that we wouldn't get clients because we were charging more than they thought we were worth. And my, my remaining partner and myself were the ones on the other side of the camp that said, no, we need to be charging more and we need to figure out how to persuade clients of the value that we are worth more. And he and I learned and devised some ways to make plain to the clients the value we're delivering. And an the other problem with this is we were aware that we'd have this argument at statement time about how many hours we should discount off the bill. Mm, mm, mm. Every month. Not uncommon. Yeah. We had a number of clients where the two partners are arguing, oh, we can't charge them that much. They, because they have no idea how much work we put into it. And mm -hmm. they, they won't perceive it. Mm -hmm. And and they were expressing a true thing that one of the problems for architects is we, we're 
we perform a service that is a black box service. Mm. Clients think that we are spooky wizards. And, and when they see the deliverables, they don't realize that they're the tip of an iceberg, that seven-eighths of it can't be seen. Uh, it applies in that sense, too. And because they're unaware of the labor, and some of, it, you know, it's, some of that labor is just in your head, You're sitting, thinking about something for an hour before the, the, the concept bursts forth and you're able to express it. Or you've, you've come up with an idea and now it takes an hour or six hours or three days to, to resolve the, the competing, conflicting uh, issues that need to be settled before you can call it a, a proper design. Mm-hmm. Their lack of awareness, their lack of perception because they're not over your shoulder is not an excuse for saying we should charge less because they, they are unaware of this work we did. So a big part of my job in selling and persuading clients about the value is to make them aware of more of that background activity and not, you know, in any granular detail that would be overwhelming and boring. But I'll, I'll drop little hints to them about some aspect of the service that they're usually unaware of so that they have a sense you know, of how long it takes to get through the permit process or how, how much effort it took to research the products that went into the specifications and, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and pretty soon you get regular comments. I get regular comments from clients about, oh my gosh, I can't believe all the things you guys keep track of and how organized mm. you are. And <laughs> I can't believe all these drawings. And, and pretty soon they're up there where they're perceiving, uh, let's say, five-eighths of the total mm. work. Mm, mm. Uh, one time, Enoch, one of the things I did struggling with this problem with a, a client that paid us, I think it was our second or third client that paid us a million dollars in fee for a home design. And I, from some of the things she said to me, I knew that she was completely unaware of how many people worked in the background to bring this one thing or this other thing into being in the house. And she, she'd come along with a antique door panel that she wanted me to incorporate into her front door that I'd already designed. And it was already under construction and it had a, a stone archway with a, a stone arch over the top of it. And this antique was completely the wrong shape to go into this existing space. And she agreed it would be too expensive to tear out the stone and start again. So we were working mm. with that as a remodel of a, a new house under construction. Mm. And I realized that that door project, which ended up costing $120,000 for a front door. So this is, this is a spectacular front door. I realized that it was an opportunity uh, to have a very finite package so it's not a whole house. It's not windows all over the house. It's not a design concept of the whole house. It's it's one discrete element of it. There was an opportunity to write a book documenting the design and build process and then gifting that book to my client so that she had a deeper appreciation of, of that door specifically, but for her to extrapolate Oh, it's not just the door. This probably applies to the cabinets. It probably applies to this and that and the other thing all over the house. And it it served that goal. Uh, for one thing, they treasure that book. So it's a mm. the marketing collateral of that is unmeasurable. It, that, that book sits by the front door. And when someone comes through the front door, or hasn't been there before, they say, that book door is amazing. And she says, wait till you see the book. And she hands them the book and they flip the, oh my God, this door is even more amazing than I thought. And of course it's got AOMI architects all over it. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the background part purpose of that was not only to expose this client to that specific issue and, and open her mind to the larger uh, universe galaxy of things that went into her house and people, it was also a present, a love letter to 
the vendors and subcontractors and the general contractor that participate in bringing this door to, to into existence. And each of them treasure that book. They all have a copy of it. Mm. And every once in a while, someone will contact, like I had a general contractor a, f- a few years ago that contacted me and said, I just saw this book you wrote. I have to work with you. <laughs> that's good. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. And it's an incredible book. I mean, I've seen it. It's, it's amazing. It truly is. It's remarkable. And uh, it's interesting how it, uh, obviously someone who, anyone who gets their hands on that book can see the, the craftsmanship, the detail, the effort put into doing something like that. And, uh, you know, the high level of uh, attention to detail that you put into everything that you do. Yeah. Yeah, it tells a lot of different parallel stories that are important to get across. Uh, but that that book and, and some other things we've done over the years has built this underlying vision framework that through BOA has become more crystallized and has greater clarity in how we convey that to people. But it's it's always been there brewing under the surface and then welling up with things like this book occasionally. Mm-hmm. And it it really does pay off in expressing to clients and colleagues that will want to work with us what it would be like to work with us and why they should want to work with us. And it's resulted in some uh, a great deal of success for us that I'm proud of, of uh, what we built here and and how well it works and how many people we've helped. And, you know, it goes beyond your own personal satisfaction with uh, being happy with the design and seeing it realized. We also reflect on how many thousands of people have benefited from the projects that sparked out of our brains. Mm -hmm. That certainly the clients benefit, but all those contractors, the vendors, the craftspeople, mm-hmm. the designers and engineers. Yeah. Each one of them had something really interesting, meaningful, and memorable to work on for a time that produced a lasting permanent, well, nearly permanent value in the community. So beautiful. So amazing. So true. It's wonderful to think about the network of people that we're influencing through architecture, like you said, the vendors, their families, it just goes on down the line. Yeah. No, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, sometimes architects think too narrowly about what they're we doing. We do. We do. Yeah. So Mark, you said that you're currently at a point where you, you have a couple gaps on the team. Uh, we might have some people listening who might be good fit for those roles. Tell us what those roles are and then how to, you know, I know you're not ready to hire at the, this moment, but maybe there's people out there who, who would love a chance to work at AOME. Uh, how do they get a hold of you? So what, tell us what those roles are, kind of describe us to them, and then how people can uh, find connect with you. Sure. We will be looking for, uh, as soon as I can manage it, we're going to be looking for a senior project manager and a project architect. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't currently have a project architect uh, role. Mm-hmm. Myself and my partner fill, fulfill that role, and uh, it it does burden us with a little bit too much time in the project making mm-hmm. process mm-hmm. instead of the business development and sales process that mm-hmm. I, I need to spend more time on. Uh, if if the sales and networking is worth twenty six thousand dollars an hour occasionally, the project management, project architect part, the design part is worth maybe a thousand dollars an hour. So mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. still a, a huge gap there. It's it's yep. very valuable to us. It's very valuable to us. But yeah. I need to focus on other things. And I'm happy to have partners and colleagues to help with that. So the project architect would lead design exercises. They would lead uh, the, the more regular interactions with the clients. Uh, one of our distinguishing features is principals are involved intimately currently with every project from beginning to end, and the clients always have direct access to us. Uh, we cultivate them being comfortable communicating with other team members and, and respecting that they, they can offer s- similar value. When we bring on a project architect, 
I want to shift that a little bit more so their predominant architect uh, contact is the project architect and I'm kind of a secondary instead of the primary. Mm -hmm. As for the senior project manager, we have a junior project manager right now and, and we just we have enough work that we could really use a second project manager because that, that project manager we have is a little overwhelmed. First of all, he's junior, so he's not used to managing projects independently on his own yet. And so he's got a, a maximum capacity that we're uh, over topping at the moment. Beautiful. And how can people find out about, how can people connect with you, Mark, or the firm? Uh, through the website, you can uh, go to our about page and there's some contact information there about how to reach out to us. It, it goes to a generic email address, but uh, I have an assistant that monitors that and I monitor it and it, it get it to my attention through that. That's, that's the easiest way. We currently, we don't have a posting and we don't have a dedicated web page for employment opportunities on our website. But that's one of the things that I intend to address in the next year uh, so that we do have kind of a, a landing page for employment opportunities that tells people more about what it would be like to work here. Beautiful. Well, Mark, thanks for joining me today and sharing your, your experience and, and wisdom here with uh, us and, your, and the audience here at Business of Architecture. Oh, it's been a pleasure. I always enjoy talking with you, Enoch. Pleasure's mine. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah, one more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, the world's leading step-by-step -step business training program that's helped more than 103 architecture firm owners structure their existing practice so the complexity of business doesn't get in the way of their architecture. Because you see, it's not your architecture or design skills that's holding you back. It's the complexity of running a business, managing projects and people, dealing with clients, contractors, and money. So if you're ready to simplify the running of your practice, go to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash smart to discover the proven, simple, and easy to implement smart practice method for running a practice that doesn't get in the way of doing exceptional architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.